Um, all right, so we're continuing with chapter eight, section three. As a review, as a refresher up to this point, we've had the following formulas. So for arithmetic sequences, in order to find our formula, we do a n equals a one plus d times n minus one. And then to find the partial sum, which means it's got to be finite and arithmetic. I think I spelled that wrong. Um, this is n over 2 times first plus last. So those two formulas came from arithmetic. And then we added to them geometric yesterday. The a n formula. A n equals a 1 times r to the n minus 1. And then today we're going to add to this two formulas for sum of geometric. And this is the first one, okay? So the to find the sum of a finite, because this is the difference, finite geometric sequence, it says the sum of the finite geometric sequence, which is a1, comma, a1 times r, a1 times r to the second, a1 times r to the third. This just represents all the terms in a geometric sequence, okay? With a common ratio being r, and it can't be 1, because if you multiply times 1, it doesn't change. So that's not a geometric sequence, okay? We use this formula down here, which is a1 times... 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. This is what the summation will look like, okay? That's your little sigma notation. Again, if number on the bottom is 1, then the n is the number of terms in that sequence, whatever's at the top. If the 1 is not on the bottom, if something else is on the bottom, what do we do to get the number of terms? Top. Minus bottom plus one. So if I is zero on the bottom, for example, then I would do the top minus zero plus one. If it was two on the bottom, I do top minus two plus one. You can do the same trick if it's one, but you don't have to because if it's one, the top number is your n. But this is another formula you need to remember, okay? So a one times one minus r to the n over one minus r. All right, example seven, find the sum. So first of all, if these are looped in with your arithmetic ones, you have to know that this guy is geometric, okay? Easiest way to spot geometric is the exponent. If it's arithmetic, it could just be like an n plus four or, or a, uh, yeah, like an i plus four, or it could be two i plus four, something like that. That would be arithmetic. This is geometric because we raise it to a power. So my equation is a1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. How do I find a1? a1 is 32 this time because the bottom number is 1. So this literally is your a1 if the bottom number is 31. I mean is 1, okay? Let's say that bottom number is not 1. How do I find a1? What does a1 represent? The first number in the series. So how could I find the first number in the series? Good. Take in and plug in the bottom. Okay? So if I plug in the bottom number, even if I did it this time, I'd get 32 times 4 to the 1 minus 1, which is 32 times 4 to the 1 fourth, sorry, not 4, to the 0. And what is anything raised to the 0 power? 1. So I go back to 32. If the bottom number is 1 and the exponent over here is whatever the variable is, minus one, then I literally can just grab the number on the front, the thing that is not being raised to the power, and that is your a1. But if either of those scenarios are not what they are, if the bottom number is not one, or if the exponent is not the variable minus one, now we have to take the bottom number and plug it in, okay, to get a1. This time it's 32. One minus, what's my r? What's being raised to the exponent? Because that's your r, right? Your common ratio. One fourth. What's n? Six. Six over one minus r, which is one fourth. Are you with me so far? Yeah, what are we figuring out with that? 
we're finding the sum of all the terms in this sequence from one to six. So the other way you could do this is plug in one, plug in two, plug in three, plug in four, plug in five, plug in six, and add them together at the end. Nobody wants to do that. Yeah. All right. So now this is where think about if I have a calculator, but this has to be kept exact, how am I going to approach this? Because you can't just type that in your calculator. You're going to get a decimal and you can't use that answer. Good. We break it apart. So I'm going to do 32 times 1 minus 1 to the 6 is 1. 4 to the 6. Oh, I almost fell. 4 to the 6. I should have got my calculator. This is not something I would make you do without a calculator. Okay? But again, you might have to keep it exact. So you can't just plug that whole thing in. 4,096 over 1 minus 1 fourth. Now I got to get a like denominator in both the top and the bottom. Okay. The good news is it's really always going to be one minus something. So we're just change one to be whatever that base is over itself. So 32 is still on the front. 4,096 over 4,096 minus one over 4,096 goes over four over four minus one four. With me? Yeah. Okay, so what is, well, the 32 stays in the front. 4,096 minus 1 is? 4,095 over 4,096 over 4 fourths minus 1 fourth? 3 fourths. Now what? Good. Keep change, flip that. So this becomes 32 times 4,095 over 4,096 times 4 thirds. This will always reduce. So 4,095 divided by 3 is 1,365. And 4,096 divided by 4, God bless you, is 1024. Now I got 32 times 1,365 over 1024. And now I'm going to see if I can reduce the 32 into the 1024. It goes 32 times. And I've got 1,365 over 32. Check to make sure that can't be reduced. Two can't go both into both of them. Five can't go both into both of them. Three doesn't go into both of them. So my answer will literally stay like this. So again, I have a major test, but let's say having, if this was on the portion that doesn't have a calculator, your base might be small, like a two to the six that I could expect you to do without a calculator, or it won't be that high of an exponent. Like maybe it's just one four to the third. I would expect you to do without a calculator. <clears throat> Questions. It's a complicated process, but if you practice it, it's the same thing every time. Okay, this one says use summation notation to write the sum. We're going to take it a step further and actually find the sum, but the first thing we're going to do is write summation notation, meaning the little sigma guy. So we need it to be the sigma A1 and then R to the N minus 1, with I being whatever on the bottom. Make this the same variable. This should be N. And then whatever the, the most amount of terms on the top. So we have to figure out how to write that in summation form, and then we're going to actually figure it out. All right, so first of all, look at our, our terms here, okay? 7, 14, 28, dot, 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 896. So how can I find out, first of all, is it geometric or arithmetic? What if you're both right? Right? Well, let's look. How do we know the difference? 14 minus 7 is 7, yes? But what is 28 minus 14? 14. Okay? So not arithmetic. Right? So then I check to see if it's geometric. How do I see if it's geometric? 
14 over 7, 28 over 14. What's 14 over 7? 2. What's 28 over 14? 2. So this is geometric, okay? Sometimes they might appear to be the bo like the same, so you got to be careful and make sure you check. So this is geometric. Yeah. The only time it would be both is if it's, oh, no, no, it can't be both. It can't. It might appear to be both, but it can't. Yeah. Like times two minus like that would be arithmetic. It won't be exponential. So geometric, you're, it's going to be exponential, which means at some point it's going to grow faster. Yeah. Okay, so now what do I need? What are the components that I need for the summation notation? What parts do I need? I need A1, which is what? Seven. Good. What else do I need? I need R, which is 2. What else do I need? I need the number of terms. How do we know that? So there's all these spaces in between here, right? Okay. How could I find it? I mean, there's a couple different ways to do it. You could keep multiplying. I could take 28 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 and figure out 896, okay? But I also, this is my last term, which can go on the left. This is my first term, which can go on the right. <laughs> I know my R. What I don't know is the N. Like, this is no only geometric. Well, no, I mean like plugging in the bigger number and then like having like, this just is not going to come into Yeah, but but the this, but if it's arithmetic, we use it. The we do a n equals a one plus d times n minus one. Yeah. That you can alter if it's arithmetic. Yep, yeah, but you would keep it as like that. Okay. All right. So how would I solve for n? What's the first thing you're gonna do? Yeah, I gotta isolate it. So how? Do, what's the first thing I would do? Divide by seven. So 896 divided by 7, 128. Now what? Wait, it's a the initial number. It's a tenth the initial one was 7. Oh, get it to a common base. Get it to a common base. Change a base. Oh, yeah. Can I rewrite 128 as a power of 2? Yes. 128 would be 264. 232, 216, 28, huh? I mean, it doesn't matter how you split it. Eventually, you got to get to the twos. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 twos. Wait, what is that? It's a factor tree. So if you don't know, like, how to break it down, it's called a factor tree. Right? You would have what? Multiply, which is fine. Same thing. Okay, all right, now my bases are the same. Set my exponents equal to their 7 equals n minus 1 and n equals 8. Now I know the number of terms in this sequence, which is 8. I'm sorry. All right, now i got to write the summation notation. So the weirdy. Bottom starts at 1. I equals 1. Top. Good. A1. 7, R, 2, two exponent, N minus, well, I minus 1. We're doing it. Yeah, we're actually going to find it out now. I know it said just find that notation, but it doesn't hurt to have the practice. So we're going to actually find this out. So sum A1 times 1 minus R to the N over 1 minus R. What's A1? 7. What's R? 2. two. What's N? Eight. 8. Over 1 minus 2. If 2 to the 7th is 128, what's 2 to the 8th? 1 of 64. Almost. 256. Good. It's okay. Minus 2. So I get 7 negative 255 over negative 1, 7 times 255, 1,785. 
so you can use this equation when I solve it. Any geometric summation. It's not happening. It's only five so far. What if I tap two of them? Mm, high level of commitment. I might let it slide. It has to be like actual tattoo though. You have to just give me like the receipt of the tat. What happens if you actually have a tattoo? I mean, I feel like that defines who you are as a person for the rest of your life. So, yeah. Unit circle is cool. Geometric sequence is not so cool. This is true. <laughs> All right, last one, and the good news is this one's easier. The last one, and what's weird about this is the concept of it, because we are finding, what's the, what does the heading say? The sum of a infinite sequence. How the heck can you find the sum of something that doesn't end? Okay? <laughs> Give up, no. Here's the catch. The only way to do it is that the R has to be a fraction or a decimal. So it has to be between 0 and 1. Okay, this is the only time this works. If it's bigger than one, you cannot find it. Why does this work then? So if think about a fraction, like think about one half. As I raise it to the power that is higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, what happens to my fraction? Gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So if I were to go on to infinity with like a one half or any kind of a fraction or decimal between zero and one, it's so small, it almost doesn't change my number anymore. Does that make sense? It does, but at such a small value that, like, it wouldn't make a difference in the end. So how would you know one? Well, you're going to use this little guy, A1 over 1 minus R. That's it. So how do I know it's infinite? It will literally say infinite. It will say dot, dot, dot. Or look at the top of this guy. It's, a, it's an infinity symbol. So if infinity is at the top of your geometric summation, then you're using this formula. What would be right if it wasn't possible? Not possible. Correct. And it could happen. It'll say, well, you know, like find it if possible. And you would write, it's not possible because R is bigger than one. Or the absolute value of R even is bigger than one because the positive negative doesn't matter. All right. So find the sum of the infinite geometric series if possible. And if not, explain why. So the first thing I want to do is look for R. No, A, that's A1, right? The R is what's being raised to the power. So my R is negative a half. Ignore the sign. It's one half. Is that in between zero and one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it can be done. And my formula is A1 over one minus R. Now notice on the bottom, this became zero, right? It's not one anymore. So if I wanted to find A1, I either plug in the zero, plug in the zero, and I get five negative one half to the zero and negative one half to the zero is what? One, this still is five because usually, but not all of the time, usually if the bottom changes to zero, the exponent loses the minus one. So notice the bottom is zero, but the top exponent is now n. Those usually happen together. So if the bottom is one, exponent is n minus one, bottom is zero, exponent becomes just n. Not all the time though. So if it's any other case, you plug in the bottom number and that is your a1. So 5 over 1 minus, what did we say R was? Good. R is a negative 1 half. We absolute value it to do the check at the beginning, but actual R is negative. So then this becomes a plus. I get 5 over 2 halves plus 1 half. 5 over 3 halves. And then I cannot keep it as a complex number, I mean a complex fraction. So I keep change flip this and I get 10 thirds, and it stays as 10 thirds. Questions? Now the geometric finite you can do on your calculator, like the one we did before to check, but it's gonna give you the decimal. Remember, you can convert it back to fraction, but it will give you the decimal, okay? This guy, there's no infinity in your calculator but you could just put a really big number at the top. Like you could put 9,999,999 9, and it will get you pretty close to our value. It's still not gonna be exact, but it'll get you pretty close, so at least you can check it. Questions? So we're gonna add on a geometric, the geometric sum, and this is, we'll do finite sum first, finite sum. 
which is a1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r, and infinite sum, which is a1 over 1 minus r. Only if absolute value of r is less than 1. Absolutely. Okay, number six in the homework. It says to find the sixth term, and it gives you the geometric information. And then it says use a graph and utility to verify your answer. So to find any term in this sequence, we're going to do a n. A n equals 24 times 4 thirds to the n minus 1 is the equation that we would use. If I wanted to find it algebraically, I would, this one example said six term. I would plug the six in. To do it on your calculator, watch this, please. Okay, you actually can use the graph. So you can type this in as though it's an exponential function. So 24 times, I'm going to just do the fraction. Oops, wait, sorry, hit the wrong button. 4 thirds raised to the n, which is the x, minus 1. Hit enter, and then it's going to graph it. Okay, fraction is alpha y equals is the shortcut or alpha variable button. All right, my window's weird, but all I need to do is at least see the curve. Then if I want to know what happens at six, I go second, trace to the calc menu, and I hit value, and I put six. And it's going to give me what the y is at six, which is 8192 over 81. And that's how you can check your answer. Obviously, you would not have a graphing utility on your test for this question, but this is how you can use it to check. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about your project. So we talked about this last week. If you were not here on that Friday, remember that's a separate video, like just devoted to the instructions of the project. Um, the main components are the interview of the person, then your answers. Then a budget, then an eight semester track. This is all on the list of things that you need to get turned in. Track or plan of study. Do we make up our own budget? N um, yes. Uh, course description. And your work cited. I don't think it's in this order. I think the eight semester track comes in front of the budget, but. What we're going to talk about a little bit today is the eight semester track, the course description, how to find those things, and then obviously I can answer questions on the budget. But the interview obviously comes first. So if you have not already thought about the person you interview, you need to be thinking about it. You, we're, you're now like almost a week in from when this got assigned, and you had three weeks to begin with. So you are going to interview that person. You are going to ask them about their classes that they took, and one of the classes that they took specifically being a math class. And you have to find the course description of that math class. So let's say that I interviewed somebody that went to, I don't know, give me a college. FSU. Why would you give me FSU? Like anything but FSU. FAU, good. He said FSU. Yuck. FAU, okay. And let's say they talk to you about their pre-calculus class. You are literally going to Google FAU, course description, and then the topic of the course, whatever that course is. If they went to NYU, you would change that to NYU. You are finding the course description that matches the course you interviewed them about. So their school, their course. And then you're not just screenshotting this. You're going to make sure that that's the right thing. So for this one, it literally says this is the Honors College at Florida Atlantic University. Oh, hang on. This is the result I got, okay? Okay. And it is the actual um, syllabus from that course. And it says the course description, polynomial, rational, or other algebraic, like this thing is my, the course description of that pre-calculus course. You can screenshot this. You do not have to retype that. You can literally screenshot this. You just have to cite this source. So whatever website I'm on, I'm going to add to my list of works cited because I use this as a, as a source, okay? 
That's going to contain the description of the actual course. If you look, it should be pretty similar to ours because it's the same topic. But if it was a different math class, obviously it would be different. That's for the person you interviewed. Then when you go to find your eight semester track or plan of study, this is based on what you want to do. So who knows thinks they know where they might want to go and what they might want to do. I'm going to tell you where to find what you need. So maybe someone wants to offer up that information. Yes. Uh, South Carolina Psychology. Okay. Like University of South Carolina. So literally Google University of South Carolina P-S-Y. No. C-H. Did I spell that right? Yep. Um, plan of study. So it's usually where I start. If you go to like Florida State or you go to UF or you go to FIU, you go to UCF, I literally can type that in like University of Florida, University of Central Florida, the, the major you're interested in and the words plan of study and it will usually bring you right where you need to go. So if I click at the University of South Carolina, it gives, it takes me to the psychology bachelors of arts and then hopefully somewhere on here, sometimes we have to do digging should be the plan of study requirements. Oh, no, major map. And here's exactly what you need, Bryson. You need semester by semester the courses that they recommend you take. You would just take a screenshot of this and you will pull this into your document. So my advice is to be typing the answers of your interview questions in either Google Docs or Pages so that you're getting the formatting. You should have double space and you should have um, your margins and all that set. But then these things can be screenshot and added it in. Okay, so notice it says semester one and what courses you should take. Semester two, what courses you should take. Semester three, four, all that stuff. It should go all the way through your eight semesters unless of course it's a graduate program or something like that and it will be more. Today, I had a conversation, like, somebody was like, what does a credit hour mean? That means about how many hours per week you spend in a class, but that's not specific. It doesn't have to be that way. A typical class is three to four credit hours, and you need 120 credit hours to graduate from a four-year degree, okay? So if you see, it will say you need ENC 1101, you need Psychology 101, you need Psychology 120, all these things. Once you find your plan of study, you're going to go back and highlight everything that's math. So all the math courses should be highlighted. This may or may not be an eye-opening experience for you. Like maybe you don't like math and you Google engineering. That will be an eye-opening experience. And you start to highlight all the times you have to take a math class. There's a lot, people, okay? So maybe this is like a, oh crap, that's not what I wanna do with my life kind of a scenario. Or, ooh, that, I really like that class. I'm really excited to take that. Yay for you, okay? But this is what you need for your plan of study. I will help you find this, especially if it's like an obscure college and you don't know what it looks like. I will help you find this if you need the help, but not the week this is due. It has to happen before, okay? Which means by next week, you should have your, your, plan, of, your plan of study found, okay? The other thing you're going to look for is the fees, so now give me a different college. Who else wants to go somewhere else? Wow, we're so ambitious. This is great. No one's going anywhere. Fantastic. Pick a college. UCF. UCF freshman fees. Cost to attend UCF. Almost every single website will have some sort of a breakdown of your tuition and fees, your housing, your food, obviously your total. Most of the Florida in-state schools are like this. If you go to like UM's website, it's that like times four because it's a private university, okay? But most of them will have some sort of a breakdown there, okay? This is what we're looking for. Obviously, you are going to spend money on other things. You need to make sure that if you are the type of person that knows you need to have extra amount of money because you really like to get your nails done, every other week. You know you spend this much money on going out and entertaining yourself. You're gonna add that stuff in, okay? Um, car expenses, travel expenses, all that stuff would be part of your budget. 
And again, I said it last week, but Numbers has a great budget template. It's called Simple Budget. You put all that stuff in. It gives you a little pie chart. It shows you all your expenses and all that stuff. And then for your income, you have to do some talking with your parents. How am I going to cover the cost of college? What does Bright Futures cost? Do we have prepaid? How, many, how much am I going to have to get in loans? Because if that's what it is, that's what it is. If I have to get a job, how many hours am I going to have to work at that job? And you are not going to be a freshman in college making $100 an hour doing anything. So be realistic about what you can do in order to earn money, okay? Questions on any of that so far? Okay. So budget, you do the research. If you're planning to live off campus in an apartment, you need to find out how much an apartment would cost. If you're planning on living at home, maybe your housing is $0. Maybe your parents are charging you rent. I don't know what kind of agreement you have worked out with them, but all of that has to be included in your budget, okay? And then we just did at least three things that required different websites. The work cited has to include those things. Remember, it has to include the person that you interviewed. It has to include wherever you go to get your plan of study. It has to include your course description. It has to include at least the fees. And if you do more research on fees, then obviously that has to be included. No, the college you're looking for, your plan of study and your fees are yours. The only thing that is based on that person is the course description of the course you interviewed them about. Yep.